how are Morrissey's ego, the Ancoats district of Manchester, and the Rolling Stones connected? You're about to find out. We're at a stage, stated Morrissey in an NME interview, where if I rescued a kitten from drowning, they'd say, Morrissey mauls kitten's body. So what can you do? Morrissey has always had a clever turn of phrase, a sharp wit, and one of the most self-sacrificing personas in music. He just rubs people the wrong way, says things that are completely at odds with his core audience, and tends to be the harbinger of his own doom and gloom. Hi, I'm Andy Fenstermaker, host of Poetic Wax, a weekly music history series and now audio podcast where I dig into the record collection I've been building since the 1990s and explore the sometimes little known history of a band, album, or song within. Today, I'm pulling out my original 1986 U.S. Sire pressing of The Queen is Dead, my 1986 original cassette of The Queen is Dead, and my extensive... 2017 five LP box set of, drum roll, you guessed it, The Queen is Dead. Which brings us to, no surprise, The Smiths' 1986 song, Big Mouth Strikes Again, which opens the B-side of the album, whose name I've now repetitively said ad nauseum. Big Mouth is one of those songs that just grips you. Honestly, it was one of the first songs that drew me to the Smiths' music. I have always loved this track, and it's that driving guitar that really solidifies it for me. But beyond that, it gets into some very interesting territories. This charming man, Morrissey, whose group, the Smiths from Manchester, have been voted Group of the Year in the enemy poll. If you haven't yet experienced the Smiths phenomenon, follow me. Big Mouth Strikes Again by The Smiths is one of those songs that just lingers. It's brash, it's witty, it's a little bit tragic. Written at the peak of The Smiths' career, the song captures Morrissey's complex relationship with fame, criticism, and his own role as an outsider. But to fully understand why Big Mouth resonates, we need to dive deeper into its history, biting humor behind it and the very real frustration it expresses. By 1986, the Smiths were already a cornerstone of the British indie scene. Their third album, The Queen is Dead, was a bold statement. It was an album that balanced light and dark, with Johnny Marr's jangly, intricate guitar work providing the perfect backdrop for Morrissey's sharp, sometimes melancholic lyricism. One of the standout tracks from that album, Big Mouth Strikes Again. Written by Johnny Marr and Morrissey, the song was fast, direct, and built on a driving, repetitive guitar riff. Marr would note that he was striving to create his own take on Jumpin' Jack Flash by the Rolling Stones with that riff. Here's a quote. I wanted something that was a rush all the way through. I thought the guitar breaks should be percussive, not too pretty or cordial. While the music was upbeat, the lyrics told a different story, a tale of someone whose words have gotten them into trouble again, again, and once again. And if there's one person who knew about that, well, it's got to be Morrissey. I must ask you, what right does the fact that you are a popular and successful pop star give you to comment on political and local well, I matters? Well, I feel that if, if, um, if popular singers don't say these things, who does? We can't have any faith in playwrights anymore. We can't have any faith in film stars. Young people don't care about those things. They're, they're dying art. And if you say, what rights do you have? The implication there to me is that, you know, popular music is quite a low art. It should be hidden. It can be there, but let's not say anything terribly important. Let's just, you know, make disco records or whatever. So I really feel that, that we do have an obligation. And um, I, I know that people respect it and they want it. And, it's working to great effect. That high-pitched voice in the song was originally supposed to be Christy McCall, but after she recorded the bit, the band found the harmonies weird and ditched them. They'd bring her back to sing on Ask, which would drop as a single in 1986. Instead, Morrissey filtered his own vocals through a harmonizer, giving it a chipmunk-like sound. In the liner notes, these vocals would be credited to an Ann Coates, a pun on the Ann Coates district in Manchester. So there's those two references. And, of course, you got Morrissey's ego, too. This was the third and final of a triptych of highly personal and critical tracks by Morrissey on the album. 
It began with the boy with a thorn in his side, a hopeless lamentation of the criticism the media has towards Morrissey himself. Next is Rubber Ring, which, according to Songs That Saved Your Life, The Art of the Smiths, 1982 to 1987 by Simon Goddard, addressed his audience questioning their loyalty and the validity of his work. And finally, Big Mouth Strikes Again, in which Morrissey paints himself a martyr. Morrissey was never one to hold back, and still is to this day. By the time Big Mouth was released, he'd already developed a reputation for his controversial public statements. He could be critical of just about everything, government, celebrity, culture, even his own fans, but the media often latched onto these comments, sometimes blowing them out of proportion. The media? Really? <laughs> no. Do you two ever get annoyed at the attention given to Morrissey? Um, no, not really. I think he deserves the attention he gets. Um, I oh, come on, come on. There must be a little sometime when you think it's all, all Steve, all Steve Morrissey up there. This public perception, the idea that Morrissey couldn't keep his mouth shut, was the spark for Big Mouth Strikes Again. In an interview with NME, Morrissey explained that the song was about how his words often backfired. He said... I often feel like a lightning rod for so much criticism and abuse. And that song was a way of expressing how ridiculous the whole thing felt. In essence, Morrissey felt misunderstood. He'd say something tongue-in-cheek, and it would often get spun into controversy. It's all there in the lyrics. I mean, let's take a look. Sweetness, I was only joking when I said I'd smash every tooth in your head. It's a sharp and violent line, but followed immediately by the disclaimer that he was only joking. This captures Morrissey's frustration with how his words are often taken, his biting humor often perceived as cruelty. While the song expresses frustration, Big Mouth Strikes Again is also deeply funny, full of Morrissey's trademark self-deprecation and irony, something that is infiltrated throughout the every single corner of The Queen is Dead. Take this line, now I know how Joan of Arc felt, and as the flames rose to her Roman nose and her Walkman started to melt. Here, Morrissey compares himself to Joan of Arc, the historical figure who burned at the stake for her beliefs. But then he throws in the absurd image of her Walkman melting. The historical drama is immediately undercut by modern absurdity, a Walkman of all things. Remember, it's the 1980s, and that's what people listened to music on back then. It's Morrissey at his best, blending tragedy with humor, mythical imagery with the mundane. He's poking fun at his own sense of martyrdom, exaggerating the plight while acknowledging the absurdity of it all. This duality, the mix of grandiose suffering and iconic detachment, is what gives the song its edge. Morrissey is both self-pitying and self-mocking, playing up the idea of himself as a misunderstood figure persecuted for his honesty. At its heart, Big Mouth Strikes Again is also a song about alienation. Morrissey's lyrics resonate with anyone who has ever felt like an outsider, misunderstood, isolated, rejected by society. The line, and I've got no right to take my place in the human race. This captures it perfectly. It's this feeling of not fitting in, of being ostracized, and it's something that many Smiths fans connect with on a deep, personal level. Morrissey has always sung for the misfits, the ones who felt out of place, and Big Mouth most certainly continues that tradition. But what sets this song apart is that Morrissey doesn't just wallow in self-pity. He uses humor and wit to process that alienation, making it both personal and universal. He chastises the media while slapping himself with an overdramatized woe is me. But at the same time, he kind of pokes fun at himself. I mean, who else could be the big mouth but Morrissey himself? He just can't help it. And he kind of knows that. Oh, and uh, if, by the way, you, like me, think Morrissey just can't help but open his big mouth, go ahead and hit that like button and then subscribe and do all those things. Since its release in 1986, Big Mouth Strikes Again has become one of the Smiths' most enduring tracks. 
while it never reached the top of the charts, it remains a fan favorite and a personal favorite. But perhaps its most lasting legacy is its influence on alternative music. The song's mix of biting lyrics, jangly guitars, and self-aware humor has left a deep mark on indie rock. Bands from The Strokes to Arctic Monkeys have taken cues from the Smiths' ability to blend personal frustration with clever, sardonic storytelling. Ultimately, Big Mouth Strikes Again is a reminder of the Smiths' unique place in music history. It's a song that's as much about alienation as it is about embracing your flaws, about speaking your mind, even if it gets you into trouble. And that's why decades later, Morrissey's big mouth continues to strike a chord. Example, dig into his aptly grandiose autobiography, simply titled Autobiography, to literally no one's surprise. I'm not surprised. Well, well, why are you not surprised? And you get Morrissey's can't help myself big mouth persona through and through on every line. If you enjoyed this breakdown of Big Mouth Strikes Again, be sure to like and subscribe for more deep dives on the bands, albums, and songs you love. Let me know in the comments, what is your favorite song by The Smiths? Episodes of Poetic Wax go up every single week right here on YouTube. I'm Andy, and I'll see you next time. With the ideas you have and the feelings you express, I always wanted to ask you, Stephen, why do you want to be a pop star? Well many reasons it doesn't make life worse that's all that i can say it's quite interesting you should try it one day <laughs>